opportunity to announce that we held an executive session prior to this meeting at 6.30 p.m. to discuss personnel and legal issues. Please stand and see the flag. <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Did it flood? 
and that's when we realized the sewage lines were running the wrong way. And that's a pretty, like, I'm not a construction person, but I think that's a pretty simple thing to do. And uh, I can't believe that, you know, this far in, we just found out now that we have sewage issues. Um, so those are my questions. Thanks. Mr. Feeney, if you don't mind, I'll address um, your questions in inverse order. The, the grinder pump will be explained uh, at the time of the motion. Uh, and, you know, the, the uh, questions you have will be answered. As far as the attorney, um, let's start with the question of why we need an attorney for construction. Right now, we don't know for sure that we're going to need the attorney. Uh, we want to have the attorney retained. He has given us uh, some advice on a couple of matters, but he's not actively involved in any day-to-day -day work uh, at the school. But uh, for issues that may arise, um, the construction projects at schools are so complicated and the construction law is so specialized uh, and um, very, very complicated and difficult. And uh, I am not a specialist in it. I, I handle a lot of the I handle a lot of the work that's being done, uh, but I'm not a specialist in the construction documents and construction litigation. We don't know if it will come to that, but we thought that uh, prudence uh, at this point early on uh, was a smarter course. As to fees, um, the fees uh, for the partner is the higher fee that we quoted. There's a lower fee for an associate and there's a lower fee for a law firm. So the idea being it depends on who's doing the work uh, as to what the fee will be. Hopefully things will continue to move apace uh, and we won't be into large fees. Uh, that of course remains to be seen, but so far things seem to be going well and we really haven't uh, had the need for extensive consultation yet with the construction attorney. Um, you know, um, I would say that in Westmoreland County, the average divorce attorney charges anywhere from 175 to 275 dollars an hour. My standard fee, if I was doing work separate apart from the school district, for which I charge 135 dollars an hour in copying the mileage, it is generally uh, between 300 and 400 dollars an hour because of my experience. So the, the fee itself is, is certainly high, uh, but that is a fairly standard fee for that specialized area of service. Okay. Sure. Anyone else? Seeing no one, we move for adoption resolution number 16, approval of the minutes. Second. We have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. Solicitor, <coughs> um, as we just discussed, I recommend that you move on resolution number 17, the approval of letter of engagement for legal services uh, with uh, Alan Torrance and Vicki McKinney and Chilco and the Area Field School District. By the way, I, I didn't say um, Mr. Cuny, but the individual that we're retaining is a is an, Alan Torrance is the partner there. He's an excellent lawyer. Uh, I dealt with him on a construction project at another school district. Found him to be uh, extremely competent and reputable. And he also comes uh, as a recommendation of one of our board members who also is in construction. So one never knows, but we, we've had really good experiences with him in the past, and I think they'll be good for the board in the future. So good. Second. Yeah, motion on the floor and second. Any questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. Education and planning, Ms. Mink. Thank you. We're going to begin with a presentation by Mrs. Stewart, Principal Bagley, uh, about the Bagley Elementary School Girls on the Run. Thank you very much. This year, um, 20 girls from Bagley Elementary School participated in a program called Girls on the Run. The program was led by three dedicated coaches, Melissa Wisniewski, teacher at Bagley, Lynn Scalise, parent, and Caroline Pasquarella, who is an extended day substitute teacher. 
Over the course of those 10 weeks, these coaches dedicated 40 hours of their time serving as positive and caring role models, leading the girls through lessons that foster the development of essential life skills to help them navigate their worlds, as well as establish a lifetime appreciation for health and fitness. I would like to introduce to you Melissa Wisniewski and some of our members of Girls on the Bank. I am Melissa Wisniewski. I am a third grade teacher at Badley, and um, I'd like to thank you for giving us your time so that we can share with you something that means so much to us. Um, as Mrs. Stewart had explained, um, Caroline Pascarell, she has done many long-term subs with the district. She was uh, one of my fellow coaches, and uh, Lynn Scalise, who was a parent of Bagley as well, and um, you will hear from them as well throughout the presentation. So what is Girls on the Run? It is a 501 nonprofit organization dedicated to encourage preteen girls to develop self-respect, healthy lifestyles, and teach life skills through dynamic interactive lessons, running games, and um, a 5K at the end. It is taught by um, certified Girls on the Run coaches and includes three parts, understanding themselves, valuing relationships, teamwork, understanding how we connect and shape the world at large. Um, the Girls on the Run at Bagley started, um, I was approached by uh, Lynn Scalise, who knew that I loved running, and um, this is my first year ter teaching third grade. So she approached me and that she um, knew of the program through a friend, who had also, her daughter had also been part of it, and saw how valuable it was. So she approached me and asked if it was something that I would be interested in trying to get started with Lynn Bagley. So I researched it and, and looked into it and found that it was just something that I wasn't willing to walk away from. Um, so we talked with Mr. Premka and, and um, Mrs. Swagger and they too agreed that it, it was a program that will benefit our third, fourth, and fifth grade girls. So we, we made Bagley a site um, and we established the coaches. Uh, we went through training, multiple trainings at McGee um, where their council is and um, we were certified in CPR and first aid training. We had a, a night or a um, parent night for the parents that were interested of um, question night. We had a couple of sessions throughout the school day, um, encouraging girls to be a part of it. And then we waited for the registration process, which was all done for girls on the run. Um, so I'm going to ask you a couple questions and how I started the um, initial meetings with the girls. Uh, raise your hand if you enjoy making new friends. Raise your hand if you enjoy playing games and being silly. <laughs> raise your hand if you enjoy, um, if you like to talk about things that are important to you, things like friendship, goal setting, things that make you unique. <coughs> we all do, and these are things that um, you will experience through Girls on the Run. Uh, we have a, a brief video. to deal with situations. I didn't realize how much of a well-being emotional side of it that they were teaching girls. We're learning so many different ways to open up conversations with our daughters and it's so neat because she wants to have these mom chat sessions at night now and so you know before bed we just continue that talk and it's been so wonderful for our bond and our relationship. Girls on the run makes me feel good and makes me feel like I can express myself. 
It helps you build confidence in yourself. The coach is right behind you saying, come on, come on, you can do it. I love that you get a group of girls coming in from the very beginning that are so diverse, and by the end of the season, those girls are a complete team. My favorite memory of Girls on the Run, I think, is seeing one of my girls from my first team cross the finish line. She needed Girls on the Run. Um, she had a lot going on in her life. I remember being at the finish line when they crossed that line, and her face was just like, I, I did this amazing thing. Girls need to know that they have a voice in this world. And I think with Girls on the Run, it reaches and it finds girls and it helps girls to understand that they are important. And because of that, they can make a positive difference in this world. be joyful, healthy, and confident using fun experience-based curriculum, which in, um, creatively in, um, integrates running. So Girls on the Run helps girls to recognize that inner strength that they have within them and to celebrate what makes them unique. Um, and they do this through various games and um, running-based activities. Uh, their vision is uh, to envision a world where every girl knows an act activates her limitless potential and is free to boldly pursue her dreams. Uh, girls on the Run, I watched my girls become fearless because they were surrounded by people that they respected, cared for them, and they trusted. They believed that they could achieve anything and that there was nothing that could hold them back from becoming what they believe is beautiful and a strong individual. Uh, Girls on the Run has core values that um, the program is based upon, um, and I'm going to briefly go through those with you. Uh, one is to recognize our power and responsibility to be intentional in our decision making. This is a very big one um, throughout the program, and, and it's it's weighed heavily in the curriculum. Um, it is a the girls learn about the importance of decision making and how to successfully navigate through life. Uh, by being responsible and intentional in all the decisions that they make. Uh, it teaches them to embrace differences and find strength in our connectedness. Um, it talks about um, embracing those differences and celebrating them. But it also talks about how to use their similarities and connectedness with their friends uh, to build relationship and um, meaningful friendships. To express joy and optimism and gratitude through our words, thoughts, and actions. Um, it, it talks a lot about being positive and encouraging others as well. Um, there is one common theme that we use a lot throughout the program. It's called star power. And we tell the girls that any negative um, situations in their life are like a cloud that cover their star. And their star cannot shine through. So Girls on the Run teaches the girls strategies to utilize when this cloud comes through or these negative experiences come through. Um, and with these strategies, they're able to um, move the cloud away and let the stars shine through. So that their star shine and they can move forward and um, look through a positive outlook. Nurture physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Uh, Girls on the Run stresses the importance of caring for themselves in all aspects of their life. Lead with an open heart and assume positive intent. Um, this is one of my favorites because it, it talks about the importance of being true to yourself and um, being free-spirited and, and doing what you believe um, and that everything is, is okay. Um, the other thing I want to mention is all these pictures within here, that was last season, those were our girls. So. Stand up for ourselves and others. Um, girls on the Run helps girls understand that it's important to stand up for others. Um, and they teach them strategies to do it effectively.
Girls on the Run um, helps girls celebrate every um, girl's beautiful. We all have a different meaning of the idea of what beauty is. My beautiful is different from what your beautiful is. Your beautiful is different from the person sitting beside you. And Girls on the Run encourages girls to embrace their own unique beautiful as well as being accepting of what other people believe is beautiful. Um, it teaches girls to be proud of who they are and every day girls can celebrate their own idea of beautiful. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Caroline, but before I go, I do have to say that not only did I walk away and reflect from this season, looking at these 20 beautiful girls that just soared and you know used their star power and grew and just used this as such a positive experience, but I also have 20 beautiful little girls that have affected my heart and will hold a special place always. Hi, as Melissa said, I'm Caroline Pascarella. Um, when I heard Melissa and when I wanted to do Girls on the Run at Bagley, I knew I would be a part of it. I taught in North Carolina prior to coming to the Trove, and I was a coach there, and that was the first season I ever experienced Girls on the Run. So I knew I needed to be a part of it again. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of what um, Girls on the Run looked like at Bagley and what our curriculum looked like. So our team was consisted of 20 girls. That was the maximum allowed girls allowed on the team with three coaches. They were all in grades three through five, and we met every Tuesday and Thursday at PBS. Um, the girls were dismissed from um, their rooms, and they are meeting this within our gym. While they were changing and getting ready for our practice, Giant Eagle provided gift cards to our team where we were able to purchase snacks um, for the girls to have before we got started for the day. Um, it was a 10-week session, or 10-week season, and we started in March and ended in May with our final 5K at Heartwood Acres where parents, family, friends were all encouraged to come and celebrate the accomplished accomplishments the girls had, whether they were running alongside the girls or if they were just being our cheering section, which we had a ton of. I remember running through that 5K and I would just hear, go coach, or Sadly's awesome, like just and it really got you through that run because it was a difficult course. Um, so we attended trainings as Melissa stated to learn how to implement the girls on the run curriculum. It was provided to us each lesson, and we were able to practice a lesson with experienced coaches and um, the head of the council, showing that we were able to effectively implement everything. Um, each lesson contained a theme, which we have listed on um, up on the slides there. And so the lessons you would go through, you'd have your introduction where you told the, uh, the girls what our theme was, whether it was connection, star power, the beautiful emotions. Um, and then you had a warm-up activity, which kind of got the girls starting to think about what that star power meant or what beautiful meant. Um, and through that warm-up, we did silly games, we talked, we and just enjoyed. Not, it wasn't very heavy into the lesson yet. Then we did our actual activity, which was where we really discussed those topics, discussed our theme for that evening, and wow, we set a goal for our running. And this is where we did the biggest running portion. So every practice, the girls needed to set lap goals and work towards that during this activity portion. And during the running, the coaches were encouraged to connect with each girl and talk about um, more in depth and on a personal level with the girls, whether um, that what that lesson is going through for them. And then we ended up with our wrap up, which is where we just, again, as a team collectively came back, reflected on what we learned, how we could apply it into our situations at school, at home, and just how we were able to use those strategies that we talked about in our everyday life. And then at the very end, which is my most favorite part, we awarded every or one girl per practice an energy award. And that award was given to the girl who really demonstrated the core values um, that Voter 
once, or somebody who just went above and beyond and just blew us away. And the energy award is like a silly little dance or a chant that we all do as a team, and we look silly, but it sends everybody home with a smile. And my personal favorite is the mohawk. <laughs> do you guys remember that one? <laughs> Um, oh, sorry. So my, and Melissa kind of touched upon this, my favorite lesson, we introduced it in week three, was star power. And again, it was to talk about um, those negative things that were going on, and we needed to activate our star power and push the clouds away and become a more positive. So we were able to use that lesson throughout all 10 weeks, and they really showed, it was, we, introduced that lesson by playing freeze tag. So the coaches were the clouds, and we were running around to tag the girls, and we were trying to cover their stars. So when they froze, they had to activate their star power by yelling something that made them happy or made for a smile to their face. Another lesson, as you can see in the picture, um, is a lesson 10 that I thought was really impactful. It was words matter. Um, that lesson, we started out squeezing toothpaste onto a piece of paper and asking the girls, well, how do we get that toothpaste back in? The tube. And they all looked at us like we were crazy. And we said, and it ended up wrapping up like, that toothpaste are like your words. You need to think before you speak because once you say something, you cannot get it back in. And so we, that lesson was a little bit different. We didn't give the theme of that lesson. We just introduced the toothpaste and went into our running. So when the girls finished each lap, they got a temporary tattoo on their arm, and we gave them clues. So we wrote each letter. Um, so by the end, the whole goal was to have words matters on their arm, so they realized that what they say really affects, um, um, affects not only themselves, but everybody else. And then lastly, um, I know we're, Lynn's going to talk about our um, practice 5K a little bit, so I'm going to talk about our final celebration. Our final celebration was after um, the Heartwood Acres 5K. We were able to invite the parents, family, um, back to Bagley and just have a team celebration of all the hard work and accomplishments these girls have um, done over the 10 weeks. So we, were, we had a potluck where all the families had some food and we had a PowerPoint. Um, just with all the different pictures that we had over the season. We also um, gave like superlatives to every girl um, that we thought fit each one of their personalities. 31 also was partnered with Girls on the Run, which is the bag company. Um, they donated huge duffel bags for every single girl on um, our team, well actually every girl that was participated in Girls on the Run for, through the McGee Women's Council. So we were able to give the girls a tote bag and some extra little goodies to celebrate as well at our end of the season party. And then we're going to come up and... Um, the next couple slides are just um, pictures of two highlights of our season which were the practice 5K, um, which was held at Bagley Elementary, and our final event, the 5K at Hardwood Acres. Our practice 5K was held on May 1st at Bagley. Uh, there was much anticipation and excitement among the, the Goder team for this event. The girls had worked so hard for eight weeks to get to this point. Um, and as coaches, we really wanted to make the event as real as possible. This is the first 5K that many of them are gonna participate in. Um, we, we, we designed a hilly course, we had a water station, we had encouraging signs lining the course, as you can see some there. Um, we had a finish line and, and medals upon completion. What made the event so special, though, was the outpouring of support from the teachers, the students, and the parents. Um, the Bagley faculty and staff made signs, they cheered along the course, and some even ran alongside the girls. Um, encouraging them with positive words. Members of the student body decorated the final stretch to the finish line with chalk art. You can see that in the top right. Um, parents and siblings staffed the water station, cheered, handed out popcorn, took photos, 
and handed out gift bags at the end filled with fruit, um, a Girls in the Run water bottle, uh, and a t-shirt. To see the drive and determination uh, in the girls' eyes that day was so truly inspiring. This, this wasn't just an individual event. This was teammates running together, motivating each other to do their best. Um, and it wasn't as much about running as it was about confidence building, friendships formed, and believing in each other to accomplish the same goal. In the end, uh, the entire team joined the final runner to cross the finish line together. It was emotional to witness the girls' inner strength, connectedness, and growth. We couldn't have been more proud of our team and the entire Bagley community support. I'm sorry, this was And then our final event was um, on May 20th at Hardwood Acres in Pittsburgh, um, with 72 teams participating from Western Pennsylvania and over 2,000 participants. At this event, each Goder girl um, runs with a parent or a mentor running buddy. The early morning track to the beautiful Hardwood Acres for the, set, for the 8.30 a.m. start was filled with excitement. The enormous field at Hartwood, if you've ever been there, it's a huge, beautiful open field, um, very scenic course. The field was filled with 72 team tents, a face painting station, a DJ, appearances by local mascots, the Eaton Park Cookie and the Penguin Iceberg, the Kona Ice Truck, uh, go to merchandise shop, water stations, and a tent with post-race snacks. Drones buzzed overhead, um, capturing all of the fun of the morning. The joy of the accomplishment at the end of the run was shared by parents and girls alike. Um, for me, it was an honor and a privilege to not only be a goater coach, but to be a parent of a goater girl. Um, to witness firsthand the growth and confidence development in my daughter during the 10 week, choked up, 10 week program was very gratifying. Um, I find myself referring back to lessons frequently in our family discussions together um, since the season ended. And in a world where negativism is so prevalent, this program brings so much joy and optimism and positive growth in our daughters, teaching them that they have the power to rise to any challenge and can change the world. I'm grateful to Mrs. Feiger and Mrs. Stewart for their support in starting this program at Bagley. <coughs> and I'm truly grateful to my fellow superstar coaches for their time in making this first season so special. I'd like to introduce Carol Tinsley, um, another fellow parent. Hi, I'm Carol Tinsley. Uh, my daughter is Addison Tinsley. Um, I tried to narrow it down to just a couple of points, and it was really hard. I was going to try three, but I had to go with four. But um, first and foremost is that my daughter just truly enjoyed the program. It was a joy to pick her up from there. Um, she actually just even, even recently participated in the cross country camp that was held two weeks ago. She's like, yeah, it's fun. It, just, it, wasn't, it wasn't the same. So, um, just the joy of going to the practices really reflects upon not only the program itself, but then also the coaches as well. The other point, uh, second point that I have is the physical and the emotional well being that the whole program teaches. Uh, obviously, with running, there is that physical aspect, but then they, with each day, there was a theme, and that helps teach those soft skills that, you know, as they get older, that we want them to have. Uh, community within the school is my third point. I mean, you have three grade levels. You have girls that are there because of a common interest with no barriers. There's a scholarship program that they offered children who couldn't afford it or different rates for different children based on financial income. So there got to be, there was 20 girls that got together that might never have taught. And I know um, the teacher as well that when you have a third grader and that fifth grader in the hallway says hi to you, like that's a big confidence booster. So, and that just creates then that community within the school, those girls passing each other and we hope that it changes. 
And my last point is the practice by a cake, because that was my favorite. Uh, Hardwood Acres was fantastic, and that is a very difficult course. Um, and it was awesome seeing all the girls in their blue shirts <coughs> with their number one race tags on. Um, but it was the practice by a kid that I probably enjoyed the most. Um, the coaches put together, and it was amazing. Um, we, as a family run, and we participated in quite a few events, and it was phenomenal. I mean, there were glitter bombs, there were signs, there was the, the final um, award that they got for their ribbon. Uh, so they put a lot of time and effort into the program. And actually, the, the point that I wanted to end on was the fact, as Lynn had mentioned, is when the last girl was coming across the front of the school, all of the girls just rallied with her and just helped her get across that line. And it was, it was a pretty emotional ending there <coughs> to the end of the race. Um, and the other last, very last thing I want, I asked Addison to say a few things. But she but I asked her, what was her favorite practice? And it was the day that they ran in the snow. <laughs> and her favorite theme was the star power. So uh, thank you for having me back in the program. And thank you to the coaches. Uh, Claire, Benny. Hi, my name is Claire Benning, and I'm going into fourth grade this year at Bagley. I was involved in this year's Girls on the Run, and I really enjoyed all the practices. The practices were fun because we played games such as meatball. The point was to make the person in the middle of the circle laugh, and if you did, you would now be the person in the middle. I also enjoyed the game with the shower curtain because you had to work together and get the shower curtain flipped on the other side without touching the floor. Practices allowed me to learn about working together, compromising, and much more. I made tons of friends during Girls on the Run, and I had lots of fun running with them. Practice 5K was so much fun. When I crossed the finish line, I was so happy that I did. My mom, grandma, and brother were all there. For the real 5K, I ran with my dad. I had my hair spray blue and pink, <coughs> and I had face chalk on all ready to run. When I crossed the finish line, I was so overjoyed. And to chop it all off, I had kind of kiss. Girls on the Road really was the best thing ever. All thanks to Coach Wisniewski, Coach Felice, and Coach Basquero. I'm looking forward to being a part of Girls on the Road again.
So I would like to thank our coaches um, for dedicating so much time, and I look forward to this year's program as well. So thank you, Russ. Does anyone have any questions? I don't have a question. I just want to make a comment and thank you, parents, and especially you, Bill. But I can't believe you come here and talk to all these old people. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so tall. That was beautiful. And that, that's what it's all about. Thank you so much. It makes you feel good to see all these qualities. And thank you for letting us share tonight. Oh, it's something that's so positive that we really wanted to get the I just I would like to add too that I think this is a fabulous program for young girls because we all know the research shows that their academic success drops off as they get older. So my, my hope is that this kind of program will empower these young women to become even more than what they potentially could have been before. And I think it's fabulous and I also very excited because I have two and a half little girls and her <laughs> Someday she's going to be. Yeah, she will be a girl woman. Absolutely. Right. How do the kids get into it? I wonder if there's more kids that want to do it than there's spots for that. There is a registration process, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, when you hit your cap, um, everything is done through Girls on the Run. Um, their central office. We do not handle any of the registration. All the money is dealt online. Um, so they open up for a week and they see how many you get. If you are under your number, you're fine and they just fill you until you hit your number. If you are over your number, they um, stop registration for a week and they run a lottery and they, they do it by random. And then they email, they notify everybody Know, if you are on the team or if not and then from there on out if you hit your max your site is closed a second team is an yeah. option if we do that a second team is an option um, if you have a number of coaches I mean it's it is the it's two coaches for 15 girls three for 20 um, I believe that you can do if you have four coaches you could do two teams of 15 and then if you have six you can do do you need a teacher you need the teachers one of the coaches I do not believe that you do need the teacher a teacher. And how can we get more adult women certified as coaches? I know that there were some parents that approached us, um, and I know that there were some um, there were some teachers from Mountain View that had also looked into it, and I think that they are also interested in starting and making Mountain View a site as well. Yeah. Did you do this during the school day, or did you do after school? <laughs> it's after school. After school. And I do have to say, Girls on the Run, it's a nonprofit organization. They do a lot of grant writing. They do a lot of fundraising, um, donations. There are a lot of scholarships available to the girls um, signing up. So depending on what your income is, you know, is what you pay. Um, there are options for getting girls that may not have tennis shoes, um, ASICs, um, and getting them shoes to wear, proper shoes to wear. So. It's a wonderful program. It really is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I applaud all of you. And thank you so much for coming and telling us about this. But especially the coaches who put in a, a, a lot of time into this, a lot of dedication to the girls. And congratulations to all you girls. You handled yourself so professionally in a microphone. And uh, I can see that this really produced very positive results. So congratulations thank to you all. Thank you.
A lot of professional development occurs during this time as well. This year we do have four professional development days. During that time we have professional development on um, various topics, one being uh, school safety. I know Mr. Um, Brunka did a presentation on that. We also talked about Every Student Succeed Act and did an overview on that, which has replaced um, the No Child Left Behind Education Act with that. Um, we, have, we will have a professional learning community, uh, professional development. We've had professional development on various software, eball pass, flex time, which will be utilized during our new schedule, during Lunch and Learn um, for that, as well as many special education trainings, dealing with uh, mental health first aid training, and as well as high impact influences on achievement, math professional development, reading, journeys. You see it's been a very busy two days, and we have two more days that are going to be just as busy. And we will close Friday with our second day of teacher induction. So it's, it's very exciting. We're, it's great to be back. We have a lot of great things going on. So are there any questions about anything? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. for adoption of resolution um, number 18 to approve the sixth grade PAN programs and dates. So moved. So motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. I'd like to bundle resolutions number 19 and 20. Number 19 being to authorize the administration to seek bids for the purchase or lease of one driver's education vehicle. And 20 to authorize the administration to seek bids for the purchase of a baby grant at the end. So that's it. Sir. motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. I'd also like to bundle resolutions number 21 through 27. These are all agreements that we approve at the beginning of every school year. Um, we did discuss them last week, so um, so moved on all of 21 through 27. Second. From the motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. And lastly, I move for adoption of resolution number 28 to approve a tuition student for um, the 18-19 school year from Lillian Valley School District. Second. I have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. And um, lastly, our next curriculum <coughs> committee meeting will be held on Tuesday, September the 18th at 5.30 p.m. here in the CSC. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Names. Finance. I move for adoption of resolution number 29 to approve the treasurer's report. Second. A motion on the floor. Second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. I move for adoption of resolution number 30, payment of bills. Second. Motion on the floor. And second. Questions on a motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. I move for adoption of resolution number 31 to approve the 2017-18 tax exonerations. Second. Motion on the floor is second. Questions or comments on a motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. I move for adoption of resolution number 32 to approve 2017-2018 year-end budget transfers. Second. Motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. I move for adoption of resolution number 33 to approve gift grants and donations. Uh, I would like to point out that one of those is the Yomaha 2 T22 Upright Model Piano. Second. 
We have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. Finance committee meeting, uh, committee meeting minutes from August 14th are attached. Next finance committee meeting is Tuesday, September 11, 2018, 5 p.m. at the Senior High Library. Facilities Operation Planning. I move for adoption of resolution number 34, approved new LES contract modifications as second. listed. So motion on the floor and second. Questions on the motion? Yes, and we have an explanation. Okay. For each year. That's right. Uh, change order 20 is for the sanitary lift station. Um, we got to give a brief history. Portions of site utilities weren't able to be physically located during the surveying process. It was done in early design by our surveyor, which was contracted directly by the owner. Uh, they made recommendation to uh, us as far as we could not locate that. Per contract, we were required to reach out to the local municipal authority, which they did, which referenced them to their engineer record, uh, which is Gibson Thomas. While they were helpful, their information was also incomplete as far as two important uh, manholes on Lincoln Avenue, which is a sanitary line which runs along Lincoln Avenue. Uh, the design had that line be a tie-in for about 50% of the building. 50% of the building, which is the academic wings, uh, that face Lincoln Avenue. Uh, from there, uh, unable to locate those manholes and the invert elevations, which is where the pipe actually ties into the manholes. Uh, without that information, an assumption was made of uh, trying to tie into the, that line at that elevation, uh, guesstimated by additional information from the site utility plan. At that point, uh, we moved along as far as design and construction with the intent of locating the line on Lincoln Avenue, which was done during construction approximately about three months ago. Um, the line itself was at elevation higher than what was anticipated, uh, tying in roughly from 242, 242 feet away from the building. Uh, the elevation of the invert came out of the building uh, to the elevation within Lincoln Avenue slope would have been too uh, shallow. So uh, communication went on as far as uh, can we reduce the slope? Communication went on, can we change the tie-in location to further down uh, towards shopping save at uh, Cedar Street? Uh, both of those had a lot of unknowns tied to them. Uh, and also a recommendation of doing a sanitary lift station was presented to the district. Uh, at that time, we decided to move with that recommendation from our project design team uh, with the notion that while a $75,000 change order uh, is something you don't like to deal with during construction, if we would have known the height of the sanitary lift, uh, I'm sorry, the sanitary line on Lincoln Avenue, uh, we would have had to raise the building pad uh, substantially between one and two feet. Uh, with site construction, you try to level the site, meaning you don't remove fill and you don't bring in fill. And by raising that building pad two feet, you would have greatly missed the cost as far as getting to that elevation for your finished floor and those inverts coming out of the building. Excuse me. Are you saying that the cost to raise the building was significantly higher than the cost of the ground? We're not going into an in-depth analysis of what that cost would have been to raise it because that information was not at the time. But anytime you're adding two feet of additional building pad fill that uh, for about 75,000 square feet of building of um, square footage, you're going to definitely have a cost higher than seventy-five thousand dollars. Um, we also through our change orders, but I just want to make a note that uh, even though we're on the change order of twenty-three, we date we're at eighteen thousand dollars in change uh, in the black as far as additional change orders. Um, not that all the change orders are additional; they're just changes in the contract. Uh, but we're sitting very nicely at eighteen thousand dollars. I want to make a note. There was a comment about flooding on the site. Our sanitary line is not tied into the existing system as of yet because of this. Uh, there wasn't any sort of flooding tied to the sanitary system. Uh, hasn't been water test, we don't water test, we do an air pressure ice testing uh, for our sanitary line. But since we're not tied in yet, nothing will be affected as far as any sort of flooding or back up the sewer and drain. We have plenty of redundancies in design and construction nowadays. Uh, we never have a back up of sewer. Uh, Mr. Thomas, could you also explain the 
uh, addition of uh, $8,900 for the Nello construction. Change order 23, is referring to? Uh, yes, 23. <coughs> that involves the kindergarten uh, sink lights and the classrooms themselves, the toilet rooms. Uh, they were installed at an elevation that wasn't conducive to our uh, age level. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No motion passes. Move for adoption of resolution number 35. Request permission to advertise for bids at 1812 Lincoln Avenue site work as developed by my old division of KU Resource Incorporated. Second. Motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? I do have a question, Mr. Thomas. Can you explain that to the public, what, what we're actually putting out for bid? This is in design right now. I'd like to advertise for bids so that I can get the turnaround of construction this fall and this winter to install uh, parking spots uh, for guests in the administration building uh, before the plants close, the asphalt plants close in November. So at this point, <coughs> since you're still in design, you don't really have any estimates? No, we haven't gone through the estimating process. This is, we're roughly in the design development and construction document phase. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. I move for adoption of resolution number 36 to approve implementation of district wide. Unified communication system. Second. We have a motion on the floor. Second. <coughs> Questions or comments on the motion? Yes. What is this going to cost? Uh, it's about one hundred ninety thousand dollars, and it's the um, replacement of our current phone systems, but also working toward a unified communication uh, system to include bells, speakers, box, video. And there's um, a lot of mass notification and emergency communications as part of it. And, and we're talking about at, at Mountain View, at Back Bay. Across the district. Okay, and, and it was explained to me uh, that this will actually match what is being installed right now at the, uh, the new alley. Yeah, for, for the phone piece, yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Weissman, how are we going to pay for this? Well, we can do one of two things. We've talked about we talked a little bit about this at the finance committee meeting uh, in, last week. Uh, we have a capital reserve fund that we could dip into and pull funds from, from there. Uh, in addition to that, we have another option, which we were very fortunate to receive that premium rate holiday uh, from the consortium uh, that we participated in in the month of uh, July. Um, while we had I'd shared with the committee that there was a chance that we may get a, uh, a refund, it wasn't uh, for sure. Um, but we did get that refund check. It was about $292,000. So what I would like to do is talk with the administration and then come forward to the board with a recommendation to possibly use those monies um, for this, this um, district-wide project. Is, Robin, is that a, a firm cost? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, and that includes any type of installation? Or? That includes all of that, yeah. OK. Mr. Aguardo, just so that you know, the Safe Schools targeted equipment grant as well this year for $25,000. And if we receive that grant, that money would be allocated towards the purchase of this. Yeah, and then any surplus that we, or any monies that we don't have to spend of that money that we receive through the consortium, um, my recommendation, and again, we would want to get the support of everybody, is to uh, reallocate that to the capital reserve fund and put those towards those two grouping projects that we've, we've been discussing in front of the senior high and one of the junior high. And the only reason I bring it up because it wasn't part of the budget. That's correct. For 2018-19. So if there's you know, ways that we can actually pay for it out of the $292,000 that we have received, I, I think that we should go by doing so. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. The next facilities operation planning committee meeting is Thursday, September 6th at 3.30 at the building.
student activities and recreation, Ms. Thank you. Um, I move for adoption of resolution number 37 to approve the Greater Lake Shore Youth Football Board of Directors. Second. A motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? I do have a comment, um, Mr. President. Um, if, if you um, clicked on the attachment that came with this, you noticed that there were eight board of direct, eight, eight members of the board of directors. What we're voting on tonight are only those in the public. There was a the athletic director and the high school principal and two board members included. We are not voting on those. We are voting on the four, two representing the youth football league and two representing the youth cheerleader. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. I do have a question. Uh, is this the first year for this board? Yes. Okay, tell, tell me why we're putting a board together for youth football and we don't really have any additional boards or any other like varsity football or junior varsity, why are we doing so? And actually, who picked the uh, the the members to be on this board? Because I, I noticed there are some. Uh, I, Eric's on on the board. You're on the board as well as uh, some uh, administrators. Yeah, we were we were we were on the athletic board. I, I chair the athletic committee. That's why I'm on there. I understand. Okay. Mr. Hauser is also a member of the athletic committee as well as Mr. Macassia. Okay, uh, why are we putting this board together? I think it's because what we have is uh, uh, it gives us an opportunity to get some insight as far as where the youth football needs to go and the issues that they need to address. Uh, unfortunately, whenever we're on the athletic committee, uh, we sometimes are not hands-on down there. Uh, fortunately, we had Mr. Kremka and he had to inform us of uh, the things that were going on. Uh, so we were able to uh, make the decisions necessary on the first year. The second year, it, it was, uh, I think it was better for us to develop a board in which they could focus directly on that. Uh, it's a massive number of kids. And I think we'd be better served by doing it that way than us trying to um, group them in with everything else. How many uh, kids are participating? I, I, yeah, I, I can, we can get that first. Yeah. Okay, well, how many participated last year? How about if I answer that? Oh, uh, well, I can tell you from the flag level, we had four teams last year, uh, eight, nine kids a team. So we were at about 40 kids at the flag level. That's kindergarten, first and second grade. We have a full team of uh, juniors, junior varsity, which would be third and fourth graders. I think we were over 20. Merle, well, you were there. I was about 25, I think. Correct. And then, 30 in the season. Yeah, the, the varsity team, which would be your fifth and sixth graders, had over 30 kids. I, and I believe, I don't know this for sure, but I believe Mark telling me earlier when we had signups that numbers were right at, if not exceeding, where we were last year. But again, if you want the number for this year, I don't want to speculate. We can get it from Mark and let you know what it is. Well, I actually appreciate that. So uh, the board that we're actually voting on tonight, it will actually uh, answer to the athletic committee or, or to this board? To the board. I, I would speak to the advisory board, which is really what this is, um, at the first um, meetings regarding youth football and youth cheerleading um, that I know I attended and I know Mr. Dodger did as well. Um, there was much discussion about parental involvement um, in these activities because number one of the age of the students. And so from the very beginning of this um, program, um, it was always, um, I think, the intent to have that community leadership in parents' um, involvement and I think that's really um, what we're seeing here is that these people, as well as the athletic committee members and the athletic director and the principal, are those that will help to make decisions um, regarding the uh, teams, um, as well as um, advising this entire board regarding what's going on with the youth football program. Um, we call it youth football. We know that it also involves cheerleading as well. Um, so from the very beginning, Tell me what the function of the Greater Latrobe Youth Football Commissioner is. What is that function? And what do they do? Or that person? 
I can I can speak to what his function was last year, and uh, essentially he's a liaison between uh, football USA, youth football, um, trying to guide our coaches, uh, properly train our coaches uh, in youth football, to appropriate tackling techniques, um, and just acting as a guide and a conduit toward reshaping the game of youth football to be a little more safe uh, for our kids. Okay, is, uh, is he around in practices? Yes, sir. Again, I'm speaking from my experience last year. Season's relatively new this year. But yes, we would, he, he trained every one of our, our coaches prior to the season last year in heads up football. Um, and he would attend practice on a regular basis. He would attend meetings between the partner schools, uh, between Connellsville, Mount Pleasant, and Latrobe, when we were discussing rule changes or bylaw changes. Um, kind of acted as a, a guy. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I move for adoption of resolution number 38 to award bids for winter sports equipment. Second. The motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? I, I do have a question. Dan, th this is the equipment that we were going to use uh, some of the surplus money, if I'm actually the... Yeah, not all of it. Um, the, the equipment we identified for the surplus, I believe, is a seven-man sled, as okay. well as the um, wrestling mat. Um, those were the two larger items. There are some other items on here that have lower budget for. Okay, so we're actually, we actually budgeted for it. These items, yes. yes. The majority of these items, correct. Okay, but the the sleds we did not. So. We did not budget. We plan to use our reserve account for those items because as we talked, they were one time long recurring costs. There are larger dollar figures. We didn't want to impact the budget on them. So we said, let's pull them out of the budget and we'll purchase from our reserve account so it had impacts. Have, have they been ordered? Yes, yes, they have. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion passes. <laughs> uh, community relations, Dr. Zork. There's an attachment for the July Parks and Rec Commission meeting. And there is a meeting on September 20th at the Lake Trail Municipal Building in the Green Room at 4 30 p.m. That's all. Thank you, Dr. George. <coughs> Westmoreland Intermediate Unit, Mrs. May. Yes, um, the Intermediate Unit Board did not meet in July. Um, our next WIU <coughs> committee meeting will be held on Tuesday, the 28th of August at 7 o'clock in the WIU board. That's all I have. Thank you, Mrs. May. BWCTC Joint Operating Committee, Mr. Music. Thank you. Uh, BWCTC Joint Operating <coughs> Meeting minutes from August 15th, are attached to the fourth agenda. And the next EWCTC Joint Operating Committee meeting will be Wednesday, September 26th. And that will be at 7 o'clock over at the EWCTC building. Thank you. I, I do have a question to you, Mr. Music. Sure. Uh, have there been any more discussions about the, uh, the building? Yes. And can you actually enlighten us? Um, we Actually, we're just starting to, um, in fact, we just talked about a feasibility, feasibility study at our last uh, board meeting on August 15th. But nothing has been substantiated with that. Okay, do you have, uh, I want to call it a ticker list of, of, of some of the concerns uh, with the building? I, I know you, you, you've stated that you're going to be able to they did um, talk about some uh, potential concerns with the building. That's why they want it's to in the infancy stage. I understand. Okay. Thank you very much. Board policy liaison, Mrs. Bates. Yes. When you um, came in this evening at your seat, there was a PSBA um, handout. And again, we're looking at a slate of candidates for 2019. 
Um, it, it lists all the candidates um, that are running for these offices there. Uh, I'm going to ask that you um, look this over and um, decide, try to make a decision on um, who you would like to vote for. And then come back on September 11th, we need to discuss this and pick a slate of candidates and then Mrs. Allshouse will submit them to the SBA. So, um, if you would please um, look that over, read about the candidates and see who you think is most qualified and we'll discuss that then at the September 11th meeting. Um, and uh, we have, do have a board policy meeting on September the 6th at 1 p.m. in the administration, administrative office. Thank you, Mr. Mins. Transportation, Mr. Music. Thank you. Um, motion on the floor to approve the resolution number 30, me, nine. 39, uh, which is the, the, the school bus, the uh, school bus van drivers for 2018. Uh, Second. Have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. Motion on the floor to adopt resolution number 40, which is to approve the pupil transportation schedule for 2018 2019. Second. We have motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. Motion on the floor to adopt resolution number 41, which is to approve the individual transportation contracts for the 2018 2019 school year. Second. We have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. Mr. Palmer is here. Mr. Palmer. This evening. So um, the only information under technology is that the next committee meeting will be October 16th at 6 p.m. right here. This is Superintendent's recommendations. I ask the board to move on resolution number 42, which is the approval of a memorandum of understanding between the Brigham Trove School District. Greater Latrobe Education Association and Allison Haberborn. So moved. Second. We have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion passes. I'd ask the board to move on resolution number 43, which are resignations listed. Um, I would note uh, the school psychology intern, which was actually approved last spring um, when Dr. Soltis was here, recently notified us that she was going to be unable to do um, the internship here at Greater Latrobe for personal reasons. So I just wanted to note why um, she was resigning. So moved. Second. We have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. I'd ask the board to move on resolution number 44, which is the approval of the resignation of the superintendent board secretary, Darlene Allshouse, for retirement, effective December 31st, 2018. <coughs> so moved. Second. We have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? I just like to say we've got a mission. Thank you. Also, I'd like to say thank you very much, Tony. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yes. I'm glad you're still here for four more months. Oh, geez. I'm very here.
All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion passes. Darlene, I'll share my notes. Okay. <laughs> Just remember, we have September, October, November. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. Before she's gone, so we'll have plenty of time to um, to hopefully um, recognize that there's still four months. I know I still have a I'd ask the board to move on resolution number 45, which is the approval of professional personnel. And this is Catherine Richards, um, who is uh, an English teacher who will be at Step 1 Masters um, beginning tomorrow, August 22nd. So moved. No motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. I ask the board to move on resolution number 46, which is the approval of professional personnel substitute teacher Emily Smith. Second. <coughs> no motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. I ask the board to move on resolution number 47, which is the approval of the support personnel. This is J.D. White um, being appointed as the teacher leader in K-2 math at Dagley Elementary School. So moved. Question. Got a motion on the floor and second. Questions on the motion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. And I'd ask the board to move on resolution number 48, which is the approval of the support personnel classified appointments. Richard Baker and Stephen Sicandi as custodians. So moved. Second. Uh, motion on the floor. And second. Questions or comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> that motion passes. And I'd ask the board to move on resolution number 49, which I know is not on your agenda. It is to ask the board to approve to advertise uh, the board retreat on Monday, September 10th, 2018 at 5.30 p.m. here in the Center for Student Creativity. So moved. Second. We have a motion on the floor and second. Questions or comments on the motion? Do you have any questions from the audience? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion passes. And under other business, um, there are a lot of back to school nights going on in our elementary buildings. As Dr. Tepper said, <coughs> our teachers started yesterday. We have four full days of professional development before our students return next Monday. We're all excited about the students returning. Just as a reminder for those secondary students, in our junior high school, all seventh grade students will be reporting Monday, but in the eighth grade, it will be the web leaders that will be reporting. And in the senior high school, the nine to 12, all of the ninth graders will be coming, um, but the other students, the link crews will be coming. As you are well aware, we started this practice last year um, with our web and link crew students. Um, it is a, a wonderful day for our um, new students to our junior and senior high school, our seventh and ninth graders, to get acclimated as well as to do um, a lot of activities and to meet some upperclassmen in a different environment of, um, that rather than going to class um, as your set day. So we really um, are pleased that we are able to do this. And um, we're looking forward to the first day next Monday. In addition, I mentioned this last week, um, on uh, September 11th, Tuesday at 11 o'clock in the morning, um, we are, uh, will be attending the St. Vincent College Prevention Project's 40th anniversary program. And they are having a luncheon to honor this program. As you're well aware, Greater Latrobe has been part of this program for many years. Um, Dr. Zorch actually sits on the board, and he will be attending that lunch, but if anybody else is interested in attending, please let Mrs. Hall's house know this evening because we do need to reply by this Friday. <coughs> Thank you very much. Our meetings in September are the 11th that evening, as well as the Tuesday, September 18th here in the center. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Swagger.
Hearing of Visitors Part 2, this is where anyone in the audience can come forward, state your name and address, and speak to anything of concern. Good evening, Gerald Yandy, 106 Terra Drive, Community Township. Um, my concern this evening, and I'll try and keep my comments very brief because I've known the solicitor a long time and I know his justice to be very swift, but we'll have time. Uh, so I'll keep it as short as I can. Um, my concern is concerning my daughter's class size. She is entering first grade at Mount View Elementary. And in looking at the numbers, she's going from a class of about 19 or 20 to a class of 27. So I have a couple of questions for the board. Um, is this a concern that you share that these class sizes seem to be getting bigger? And also, what is the board's policy, if any, regarding what the optimum class size should be? I was here last week and I heard the report that there have been a number of, I don't want to call them last minute, but over the summer there have been a number of students who have registered, perhaps more than the board was expecting. And that a number of those students, maybe as many as half, were coming with an IEP or a 504 and are going to need additional attention from the teacher. Um, my wife is a teacher in the district, and she always says that if a student has a special plan like that, her colleagues feel that that's two students, or perhaps three, depending upon the problem. I, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense from the board what your understanding of the optimum class size is, and how you feel uh, the needs of the students are being met, particularly at Mountain View, or is this a district-wide problem? Are the numbers the same across the three elementary schools? Um, just in looking at the numbers, if the, and again, this is just based upon the information that's publicly available on the website, if the first grade at Mountain View were still at four instructors, the class size would be at around 19 or 20, but now that it's been reduced to three, we're at 27. What is the board's feeling on this? I'll just sit down and listen to your comments if that. Thank you. I just want to throw out some numbers and then board members feel free to, to comment. Uh, Mr. Yandy, I, I appreciate your comments. Um, I do. I will tell you that the process of determining how many teachers are in each grade level is something that starts around April. We try to get our kindergarten registration done, try to figure out what kindergarten numbers are, and then we look forward to staffing. Uh, as far as a policy or procedure, we do not have a policy or a procedure on optimal class size. If you take a look at research, go to the Google machine, do, uh, do class size. Um, if you look for optimal <coughs> sizes, research at one time showed that to have a significant impact, you've got to get around 15. Uh, research is now showing 16, 17, 18 would be the optimal number uh, for research to back up significant improvement with achievement in class. Uh, research also shows that it boils down to good instruction in the classroom. I do not discount what Mr. Yenny said about uh, a number of you know, the fact that an IEP student in the classroom can have a significant impact on instruction time, et cetera. I'll tell you that can happen in a classroom of 16, just as well as a classroom of, of 25. Um, our, from that point in April, early May, when we looked at enrollment, elementary enrollment across the three buildings has gone up 19 students. So I talked about 72 last week, Mr. Yannity. Uh, 72 enrollments. I'm not sure if I mentioned the number of withdrawals that we had as well. Um, but we did have a significant number of withdrawals, so sometimes that offsets. But last week we were at about a plus of 30 some. Uh, I can get specific numbers, but I'm just ballparking for you, okay? We were at a, an overall positive of about 30. So 19 of those kids went to elementary. 19 of them were, you know, somewhere between 15 and 19 went to the secondary level. I will tell you the two grade levels out of those 19 students, 14 of those kids went to kindergarten or first grade, okay? But other areas saw some drops of students as well. But overall, three elementaries, we are at a plus 19. When the principals and I sit down and we talk about class size and class numbers, our optimal number is, depending upon the grade, 21, 22, 23. Our average class size across the three elementaries is 22. Even with the plus 19, we are at 22. Does that mean in some cases we are at 19? Yes, second grade at Bagley is at 19 per class right now. Does that mean that we are higher in some places? Yes, Mr. Yannity talked about first grade. Mr. Yannity, right now I have 77 students in first grade 
and three <coughs> teachers, so I'm right around 25. And I, Mrs. Phelps, do we have 27 in the class? We do not have any 27 in the first grade. No. Okay, I, and I wasn't sure. I'm not doing that. I, like I, I, I didn't know that. So if that was correct, I was just doing division, which was excellently taught by your district. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but I, I have, I do have us at uh, 25 in first grade. We talk about concerns uh, when we come up with class sizes. I mean, it's a conversation among the three principals. I'm going to tell you that they, they fight with me. They do. We fight with each other. Sometimes things get thrown in the room. Right, Mrs. Stewart? Yes. Okay. Um, it's not an easy decision for us. We try to weigh the needs of, of every student, every grade level, and we don't go to a number if we're not comfortable with the supports that we can have in place. Um, I will tell you there have been times I go back to last year with uh, Kim's kindergarten. It started to get to a number where the, the average class size started to get to a number where we were starting to feel uncomfortable, but ultimately at the end, we made the decision to move forward, and, and this year we're at about the same class size as we were. I want to step back for one second. Last week I told you 72 enrollments over a 25-day period. Can I tell you from last Tuesday to this Tuesday, 51. Where all of those kids are going to shake out, I don't know. Um, I haven't looked at specifics, but I will also tell you that uh, we have 11 kids that went out, so that's a plus 40. I will tell you that a lot of the kids that are coming in now are outside of placements, so they, they won't necessarily see our halls, they won't see our buildings. Um, and, and the last thing that I would say to you too is when we do our overall counts, sometimes kids are placed in a homeroom for accounting purposes only, and they, they are never really a, a full-time part of that homeroom. They may go to encore classes only. They may receive their language arts and math instruction um, outside of the classroom. I know I just threw a lot of stuff out to you, but I will tell you that I understand this concern. I do. Uh, but I will tell you in response, it's not a willy-nilly decision that we made. There is a ton of conversation that goes into that decision. And, and I, I do listen to the principals. We balance all of our needs. In the end, we have a conversation and we move forward. If 20 kids move into Mountain View tomorrow in the first grade, obviously, we're not going to go to school with 35 in the classroom. Um, but right now, the administrative staff is comfortable with the number that we have. And, and I, would, I, would, I don't think that you've spoken to Mrs. Pellis about your individual concerns yet. I would encourage you to do that if you have specific concerns. And if any general concern. concern. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, and, and if I may ask, if you said that if you know, 20 more moved in and now you're at 35, that number would make you uncomfortable. What's the lowest number that would make you uncomfortable? Knowing there's not a set policy. And I would throw that right back at you. What is too big? Is it 25? Is it 24? Is it 23? My wife's a teacher. She yangs at me all the time about the fact that she has 22 biology kids. Like, does she yang more when it's 23? Does she yang more when it's 25? You know, I, we don't have a policy. I think that we go with the knowledge of our kids. I go with my principal's uh, knowledge of their kids, the knowledge of their teachers, the good instruction that goes on in our classrooms. I don't have a set number. That may not be the answer that you want. You probably want me to tell you. If it gets to 28, we're going to. But well, I don't no, know. I ask you for a no, 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 I just wanted to get yeah. what the board sense was of the right. class that is the right. right size versus one that's too big. I would say when, when the principals and I feel we can't manage or that our staff can't manage the need in that grade level, that's when we would have concern. But there's no magic number. Um, I, Dr. Zorch and I have had conversations sometimes about the number of kids in kindergarten. Um, we talk about it. There have been years that we've, we've had 25, 26 in a kindergarten classroom. There have been years that, uh, that just a couple years ago, they had 57 kids come into kindergarten. That was a, a low year that year uh, because of enrollment. It's another piece that factors into this. We try to look forward. How many staff members will we need down the road? I will tell you that 10 years ago, in my first year as the principal of Bagley, I had 648 kids at Bagley. Mrs. Stewart today has 546. She's down 100. When I was the principal of Bagley my first year, Mrs. Holler had over 800 students at LES. She's at 682. And Mrs. Pellis had over 700 kids at Mountain View. She's at 611 right now. So all three buildings as a whole are down about 100 kids. Sherry's down more than that. So it's, it's a trend. We have reduced staff over the last few years. But again, it's not just based on the number. It's based on the conversation that we have about the need in the grade level and, and whether our staff members, our competent staff members, can, can handle that.
We've had this conversation many times in the past. I know when I first got on the board, we tried to come up with, I think there was a push to get a number of kids, if I'm not mistaken. Is that my correct on that? We had big arguments about it. We had big arguments. They weren't discussions, they were arguments. And they got pretty heated at times. I mean, we've, we've yeah. had, you know, kindergarten classes. Um, my, my particular knowledge is Bagley, because my kids went there. I mean, we've had kindergarten classes with 24 kids, and I would argue that's way too many for my personal opinion. But I also value the opinion of my staff and my administrators telling me they're incredible teachers. They're phenomenal teachers. And with enough support throughout the building, they, they did fine. Those kids flourished. I volunteered in those classes. I saw what those kids were achieving. It was incredible. But that was that class. So you don't know from year to year. Can this class handle that many? And it is a moving target. And, and I don't think I don't think it behooves us as a school district to say, no, nope, we're never having more than 22 kids in the class. I, I mean, that would be a wonderful, ideal world. That would be fantastic. But then we still have to go to taxpayers and ask for all those salaries to increase all those teaching positions. And that's the job of this board. That's the balance that we do constantly every day. So there isn't a magic number. Sorry. Anyone else? You gave a six minute presentation on stuff with the board. Uh, some of your comments were you behave in, you guys behave in an ethical manner. Um, whether it's bullying, harassing, or spreading misleading lies and rumors, regardless of age, when we're wrong by these types of behaviors, we must maintain our character and ethical principles. Uh, you feel that somebody on this board is trying to tear the board apart. Pre premature and misleading statements about board members, it's uh, an administrators and, and the true mission of the school district have been made. Uh, the comment you really made that confuses me is our right thinking members on this board. So you're saying we have some wrong thinking members on the board too. Would you care to share who the wrong thinking members are? I'll take that as a no. Okay. So here's the test of your ethics, all you guys on the board, that you're so ethical. You know, people love to talk. People love to talk. And I know you guys aren't going to discuss executive sessions, but I'm going to bring a few things up. First question is, do we take minutes in executive sessions? Mr. Naples? Keep, keep going and at the end. If, ah, good. Yeah. No, no. Keep going and at the end, if anyone wants to address it, then you Okay. Because I feel we have some very serious problems with this board right now. Um, in June, I was at the meeting. After you guys had your executive session, some people went outside there and were talking. And what I picked off in that conversation was, that you guys were told back there to school, you'd be lucky to be in it by Thanksgiving. And then 15 minutes later, we came out here and put this big show on about how everything's right on, right on track. Right on track. Which was just such absolute crap. There's no other way to say it. Now, none of you nine board members said that you were told 15 minutes earlier back there that you'd be lucky to be in that new school by Thanksgiving. You just let that show go on which tells me you have no ethics. Not because that was a non-truth. Okay? Does anybody want to tell me that that was not said? Because you're lying. But I believe Mr. Thomas said. Does anybody want to tell me I'm wrong? 
because you know you are by far the most upstanding ethical person on this school board. You know, I asked you, Mr. Naples two months ago to have a meeting about a right to know that I was given a bunch of crap because Mark Beers never paid for Hannah Mears as part of the past. Listen, we're not going to talk about students. You're out of order. Okay. Well, you're out of, you're not, how am I out of line when I follow the right to know and you to talk to me Stop the talking truth. and let me talk. You're out of order by talking about students' names or anything having to do with students. Which, okay. by the way, which, by the way, is not true. And which, by the way, I asked you to schedule a meeting with me and you never did. No, I asked you, 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 you to schedule the order, meeting. You were out of order and you were not mentioned that's fine. I asked you to schedule a meeting. I asked you to include Mr. Hauser and Mr. Watson. We can go back and review the tape from two months ago because it's on the tape. And I said, give me a call when you can meet. And the following week I'm on vacation. So you didn't tell me. I asked you to schedule. Okay. Now, the reason I'm asking about if we take minutes in executive session, which I believe we don't, is right off the district's website. Right off your website. Well, this is important. Number one, you broke the sunshine law by meeting with those people two months ago because there's nothing here to cover that they should have been back there talking about the school. And it says, that the purpose of the executive session must be announced prior to going into the executive session, which to me means you should be in this meeting first and then you should say, we're going to go into executive session for the fall and Your time is up, Mr. Fumi. And it also Mr. says, Mr. Fumi, your time is up. I, I need you now. Minutes Mr. must Fumi. be kept. Mr. Fumi, please sit down. Please put this in the newspaper when you, please read it, because they lie through their teeth. What's so hard about being operative? Minutes must be kept, then made public, please when the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Please sit down, sir. This is so wrong when you guys do it. It's a disgrace. Thank God we have the teachers we have that make this school Mr. so great. Please, please sit down. We're going to ask you. Well, I'm sorry, but you can never answer my question. This is ridiculous. Ready for another one? Robinson Avis, 308 Cherry Street, with her. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Robardo for the common sense, integrity, and transparency he has displayed as a director of the Great Flint Road School District. These are outstanding qualities that should be admired and adopted by any director of any board. Mr. Rivaro, your pursuit of transparency and truth is recognized and supported by the residents and taxpayers. We salute you. Transparency and truth are very sacred concepts. I'm confused about the elementary school project. I ask myself, what is really going on? I thought I was alone. But believe me, you are the talk of the town. In the school district and out of the school district. Everywhere you go, supermarkets, stores, bars. Oh, you are a hot topic in bars. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I thought I was confused. Everyone's confused. And everyone's asking the same question. What is really going on? No one seems to know. In June, you had the project manager, who calls himself Captain Fantastic, states that he sees no reason the school will not open on time. A director stated that he's never seen a construction project go so smoothly. It just does not happen that way. And another director visited the school twice and stated that she stated that the building is wonderful and she found it to be frankly amazing and all the problems that they're talking about are unfound. Then we have others who are saying, this is wrong, that is wrong. Mistakes and blunders have been made. There are water issues in the school. Water's coming in from the top, from the sides, from the floor. Uh, some of these people are construction workers that see that every day. Now, I admit some of those people would have been called the horribles in the last election. But where do you turn for transparency and truth? One example is the Gregor problem. These deplorables out there for at least two or three months have been discuss discussing the grinder, what the need was, what the mistakes were made. But the first time the public hears about it is tonight, whenever you have to approve money. 
Now, why wasn't it really so public the problems? And we're going to punch just one problem. They're talking about a lot of problems. Now, does the construction foreman really understand what is going on? Or did he, did he invoke a Hillary and inadvertently make a false representation? Would the director that never saw a construction problem project go so smoothly still stand by that statement? And the director that visited school twice and found the school to be wonderful and amazing and the problems unfounded must have visited a school in a parallel universe in Bizarro World. Because those problems existed whenever she visited the school. A letter to the editor by Greg Fielding was, was to encourage the board to be more transparent and truthful. The administration released the letter as an example of transparency and saying the building project was aggressive. Aggressive is a word that has both positive and negative connotations. For example, he was a student who took an aggressive approach to learning and graduated number one in his class. Or he was a student who took an aggressive approach to learning and was a bully, got in fights in school, robbed the gas station, and is now in jail. Both students took an aggressive approach to learning. If the approach to the building project was aggressive, and the administration reports, as the administration reported, it appears that it was not aggressive enough to finish on time, or maybe it was too aggressive, and mistakes were made and not properly done. Which one is it? Don't answer that and maybe testify to that. Unfortunately, the letter from the administration created more questions than an answer. Where is transparency? The deplorable seem to have more truth and transparency than the board and the administration. Some thought that Mr. Fumi's letter was insulting. What he wanted you to do, he was encouraging you to be transparent and truthful. And it's been reported that someone made a comment about Mr. Fumi, saying that they hated Mr. Fumi, and they hated blank Mr. Fumi. And the blank word is both a adjective and a verb. So you've got 30 seconds. What's that? 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, Okay, the rest of the taxpayers just want two things from you. One is to provide a decent education of the kids. You do that. You pass out. The other one is transparency. You'll fail that one. So go home tonight. You can say how much you hate me. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. But just remember, the truth will make you free. Anyone else? Diane Panzera, 112. Good evening. Most of you know me as I've taught for 18 years in the district, retiring in 2015. While I have disagreed with some of the board's decisions in the past, especially in contract negotiations, I have always respected their commitment to the students and the community until now. I am on Paul that the Greater Latrobe School Board is suing the West Milner County Tax Assessment Board and the Cabaret Theater Incorporated, seeking to have the board reverse its decision, granting exception to the property exemption to the property located at 227 Main Street, Latrobe, Pennsylvania. <coughs> the Cabaret Theater Incorporated is a 501c3 corporation, and it meets every requirement for the federal, state, and local tax exemption. As I understand it, the school board is challenging the use of the cabaret's property at 227 Main Street, Latrobe, on the grounds that it is not a purely public charity. I further understand that the school board wants to keep that property on the tax rolls because it believes that the building is not being utilized for legitimate charitable purposes. While no theater productions have been staged there yet, as the theater company continues to improve and upgrade the structure for public access, the building is in constant use as the home of the cabaret's set building, costume construction, and all other preparatory work used in mounting theater productions. Since, the purchase, since purchasing the building in August 2015, the Cabaret Theater Company has staged plays in various Latrobe locations. The entire 2016 season was produced at the Latrobe Art Center. Additional productions have been staged at Huber Hall, and at the Latrobe United Methodist Church, where the Cabaret Theater's Neighborhood Arts Troupe Homeschool Division 
continues to meet for classes and to produce its two annual shows. This upcoming Labor Day weekend, the Cabaret Theater will present the 13 Actors Company in its production of Full Bloom at the Old Main Theater at 350 Main Street, Latrobe. This production is funded by the Pennsylvania Council for the Arts. All of these endeavors have required the Cabaret Theater building at 227 Main Street. As the school board and school district dedicate to the arts, you should be aware that the Cabaret Theater donated its time, technical expertise, and staff when the Greater Latrobe High School Theater Department requested emergency assistance in order to remedy the big difficulties of the rented Titanic set. Members of the cabaret helped to complete the build, supervise the operation of the set, and dismantle the set in a late night endeavor to meet the time constraints of shipping. Volunteering time, too, and sharing knowledge with our students emphasizes the purely charitable nature of the cabaret theater company. Additionally, in 2016, the Cabaret Theater produced Confessions of Lost Girls, an original drama written by students of the Kemmer School of Adelphoy House, which is the result of an acting class offered by artistic director John Carousel to students. This, too, was a donation to the community. To add insult to injury, the Greater Latrobe School Board, instituting this lawsuit as a response to the Cabaret Theater's request for tax forgiveness, has triggered action that has placed the Cabaret Theater's building at 227 Main Street on the list of properties available for tax sale. I am incensed that the school board would take such action. The Cabaret brings the Latrobe community local entertainment, gives Latrobe citizens of all ages the opportunity to be involved in worthwhile artistic endeavors both on and off the stage, provides young people with a creative outlet and a valuable <coughs> learning experience, and will engender more traffic to downtown businesses. Given that the Cabaret Theater uses its building as the base of operations for its productions, maintaining that it is not using the building is demonstrably false and misleading to taxpayers. In addition, the generous contributions of time and expertise the company has made to the community and the school district thus far indicates that the Cabaret Theater operates as a purely charitable 501c3 corporation. But its property at 227 Main Street enables it to do so. I believe that the school board needs to rethink its decision and support rather than attempt to destroy the Cabaret Theater. Thank you. Mayor, I'd like to uh, I'd like to respond because a lot of the decisions that were made here are very legal decisions and recommendations to the board. And I want to explain a couple things that were kind of misleading in uh, prior news articles and the position of the board's taken. Um, when that property was purchased, it had originally uh, been appraised, I believe, in fair market value, somewhere around three hundred twenty-five dollars or $350,000. And the purchase was just for a fraction of that. And before anything was done, before any decisions were made on whether this was a purely public charity, um, we encouraged, we explained, and, and literally between the tax bureau and us, we, we begged the owner at this point to say, look, this property is appraised at fair market value of, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is, but it was 325, 350,000, and you purchased it for 35,000 at least go in and get an appeal to get the value of the property lower to essentially what you paid for it because that's what you paid. And had that been done a few years ago, there probably would have been, um, I'm guessing, five to $10,000 saved, but that was never done. And, and, and part of the problem is just that we can't get through to the owner on that point. In other words, what we're saying is, yes, we have a disagreement with you about whether you're purely public charity, and I'm going to address that. But in the meantime, you only paid a little bit, you only paid a fraction for this piece of property. Please, just go in and get it appraised based on what you paid, and then we can deal with the purely public charity. To date, that's never been done. Um, and then ultimately, um, we challenged the purely public charity, 
because there is a very strict six-part test established by the Supreme Court. If you don't mind, I'm going to look at my notes because I can't remember the, the whole thing, but I, might, I, I thought you might bring this up. Uh, and, and truly, what we can look at when we make a decision is only what's presented at the time to the board, to the tax assessment board. The test is the following. Being a 501c3 in and of itself doesn't accomplish anything toward that test. The Supreme Court in Pennsylvania sets its own test. Number one, um, you must advance charitable purpose. You must donate or render gratuitously a substantial portion of the services, benefit a substantial and definite class of people who are legitimate subjects of charity, relieve the government of some of its burden, and operate free of a private motive. Now, some of things that have been going on over the last year show a charitable purpose, but beyond that, other parts of the test haven't been met, and we don't have anything. There's been, you know, no financials. We don't know who gets what, who gets to see something free, who gets discounts. There are absolutely uh, no tax returns, no financials, no nothing. And so we're in a situation where we will always review this, like you've asked. We will always review it. But somebody moving into a building saying, here's my intention, here's what I hope to do, doesn't, doesn't cut. And for the people that, you know, the businesses who are the taxpayers, we simply can't say, oh, we trust your good intentions, you don't have to pay taxes. And the sad thing here is if the property owner had only listened to the Tax Assessment Bureau, the, the solicitor for the county sat down and explained to him, look, just, you know, just you know, a couple of years ago, just file for a reduction the way you would with your house, and we'll sort this out later, and it just never happened. So we are always open to reviewing this, and, um, you know, I, I would hope that you're not critical of the board. It was really the board following the solicitor's decision. We had a very limited time period and we had to file the appeal. They weren't sued. We just filed an appeal. Uh, and obviously, as time goes on in the appeal, if they can provide us with this information, I'm sure the board uh, will, will take another look at it. But at the time that the appeal was due, there simply wasn't enough information to meet the six-part test. So, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, but, you know, this isn't up for tax sale because of us. Um, he had been turned down, I believe, two, if not three years, uh, and each time they asked him to file for a reassessment based on value, and he didn't. And that's why he's facing the tax sale. His, his, his taxes would have gone down 75% if he had just filed for a reduction. So what you're saying is that they need to file for a reassessment well, right now, and then make that information available to you. Well, right now, we are appealing their, they've been approved this last time through <coughs> as a purely public charity. We are appealing that, but we will always continue to look at any information they have, and we will certainly reassess our position. We have a deadline that we have to do, it, and to be honest with you, at the time of the deadline, you know, um, I mean, in their overview, all that they provided at the time when they filed their appeal, all that they provided was sort of a long resume of what Mr. Caracelli had done in the past. And then they said what they hoped to do, and they were putting in for a liquor license. And we're looking at this and saying, I'm just not seeing that it's meeting the six-part test. And, and it's only fair to the other taxpayers. But if he had just asked for a reduction a couple of years ago, I don't think he'd be in this position. That's just my opinion, but I, I think it's true. We will continue to reassess, we will continue to look at it, and obviously if we think that he's providing the information we need to test, I'll advise my board that. So the more information we get, the better. That information has to go to you? Well, it, 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 yes, I mean, it, it, that would be the easiest way to do it, doesn't it? I mean, technically, it would go into the discovery process, but anything that's given to me, we'd be happy to reassess it. So verifying that they meet those six points right. to establish right. themselves as right. a charity. Right. 
Yeah, and the problem we have is, I mean, the big problem we have is a lot of times, you know, you'll look at a summer camp that wants to be a charity, and then they come in, like they'll come into court and they'll say, look, here's, uh, we brought in a million dollars, but we gave, we gave uh, 700,000 further free dollar value to people that used the camp and couldn't afford it. We, you know, here, here was our, here was, uh, our tax returns, and as you can see, uh, 40 to 50 to 60 percent of what we did was charity. But we don't have anything to look at, just he puts on a couple of plays, and, and that's good. That shows something, but it really doesn't get to the, it really doesn't get to the crux of it. So we're not trying to be harsh on him. Uh, certainly this board, if you want to blame somebody, blame the solicitor. Uh, <laughs> As, as, we used to do in, as we used to do in the old days. Seal tax returns for the last few years? Yeah, he has tax returns. I mean, he didn't submit any, you know, the financials, things like that. So, if anything, we, we'll be glad to look at it. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Tammy Bailey, Urban Avenue Latrobe. First, I want to congratulate the Greater Latrobe School District to be a number one in Westmoreland County as the school to be going to. I saw that in the paper and it was really exciting to see that. That um, it takes a lot of good dedication from the board, <coughs> a lot of dedication from the teachers down to even some of the, the parents and, and to the principals of all the schools to make that possible to be the place to want to live to. Um, I was not able to attend the June meeting, and I believe you guys were out of session for July. So I am here, and I, I hate to bring up past things of what I want to speak about for something that should have been maybe talked about in June. And what I want to bring up is um, my son, my oldest one, is going into seventh grade junior high, and my youngest is going into fourth grade. So my oldest left uh, Latrobe Elementary this year as a sixth grader. Um, on Tuesday, May 29th, they held an assembly to give out awards and certificates to the students of the sixth graders. Um, some of those awards were most jump ropes, most curls, who can throw the ball the farthest, who can get the most baskets in, who can run the fastest, uh, county course, county band, guitar club, student council, cleanest cabinet, camp, it, the list goes on for those awards. Three awards were given out for the academic superintendent awards. Um, and from what I was told, this takes into account advanced PSSA scores in grades 3 to 5th in addition to the GPA. My son Jared has been in the GOLD program since 2nd grade. He is considered gifted. While in 3rd grade, he had moved up to the 4th grade math class. In 4th grade, he was the only student to score a perfect score on his math PSSAs. While, um, while he was in school, he participated, participated in band, choir in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. He was in guitar club in fifth grade only because he got the sixth grade flyer and he signed up for it when it was only meant to be for sixth graders, but they allowed him to do it. Um, in sixth grade, he took the junior high bus and started his day earlier than his normal peers and attended uh, seventh grade math class here at the junior high and then trucked back to LES to finish off the rest of his school day and have a full school day. My son has received straight A's for all his years and he did not receive one academic award. My son was crushed when he came home that day. I expected at least an academic. He's not sportsy. Um, he does sports, but he is not a jock. I guess dude, that's the term you said. He's not a jock. He strived to be the best. He strived for A's all his life. That was something that he knew he was good at. He did not receive one academic award because he received a proficient on his English language arts PSSA in third grade. And the only reason why he took that PSSA, because I wanted to opt him out of it, was because he wanted to see how well he can do on the PSSAs. He wanted to see how smart he was. Now, I spoke to Mrs. Holler, and she gave me wonderful words to give to Jared, and I appreciate those words. But there was a lot of students that were straight-A students that may have not done very well, maybe on the PSSAs, especially for third grade. And for my son to be overlooked for the accomplishments that he had, being the only peer to even go to junior high in the morning, 
to not even be recognized for academics. PSSA is an, is an individual student score that can be used to assist teachers in identifying students who may be, who may be in need of additional opportunities and the school board provides information to the schools and districts for curriculum and instruction improvements, discussion, and planning. PA teachers are evaluated on this and it's tied to those scores. And to evaluate their students' strengths and weaknesses to increase student achievement scores. And that was coming from straight from the PSSA website. From my understanding, PSSA scores are not to be held against a student for their academics. It's only supposed to help the school help them improve. And to tie a PSSA score, especially a third grade score, to the academics that my son proved that he had being a straight A student is very sad. And when his peers come up to him and say, Jared, why didn't you get an award? You're the smartest kid in, in our class. My son's sitting there saying, I don't know. So I want you to reconsider when you think about these awards that you give out, the superintendent award, not to include those PSSA scores, because that kid could have been sick that week and may just not have tested well, especially third grade. So I'm not here for pity, but I just wanted to make you aware of what that does to somebody, especially a Jared out there, who may not be sports, but strives for academic greatness. And for the trope, we've just proved we have academic greatness, and we need to lift those students up. Thank you. I would just comment that um, after last year, um, we had three students at LES. I think we had three at Mountain View. I can't hear you. Two. We had three at Mountain View. Two, three students that were recognized with the academic award, and two at Bagley. And um, as you can well aware by Mrs. Bailey's comment, Clearly, we have far more students who are academically strong. So at that time, we had discussed looking at those requirements to receive that award and discuss um, maybe reviewing and, and um, uh, modifying those qualifications. So I appreciate your comments. And clearly, it is something that we, we discussed last year after the awards were given out. So thank you, Ms. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Jeff Refuming, 258 Grandview, Gerard, Union Township. <clears throat> I see Mr. Yannity left, but I too, like Mr. Yannity, have a son entering first grade at Mountain View. And I was wondering if you have a number of withdrawals from the kindergarten class to first grade class that would warrant reducing teachers down from four teachers to three teachers in the first grade class. I'm not sure that I understand what you're asking, but I don't know the withdrawal. There was four four classes yes. of kindergarten students that are now reduced into three classes. Uh -huh. So was there a significant number of withdrawals? No. So it wasn't it was, a, it, was a, it was a matter of sitting down and talking to the principal who was comfortable with going with 25. 25. Mm -hmm. I, I believe you stated 77 people. 77. So you have 26, 26, and 25? 20, yeah. That's what she said. Mm -hmm. I also have a daughter entering third or kindergarten, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you have the numbers for the kindergarten classes. 23. 23. And what were the numbers last year? Whatever 77 divided by 4 was, 19? 19. And I'll, I'll take Mr. Yannity's word for it. I, I, <coughs> I no unfortunately, Mr. Yannity left, so I can't ask him. Okay, thank you for that. And I, I, do have, mean, I understand, and I, 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 again, I go back to what I said. We look at it every year. We look at where we can best utilize our staff, knowing that we have a certain number. It ebbs and it flows. And, and I understand, I do understand your concern at 25. I've got 25 in some other spots here too. I have 27 in sixth grade. But as an administrative staff, we're comfortable with it. But I think the maturity level between sixth grade and first grade is a significant difference. I have 25 in the first grade of Bagley too. And I get, again, I get what you're saying. 
But when we have a conversation as an administrative team, we're comfortable moving forward with that number. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I would say the same thing to you that I said to Mr. Yanni. If you have specific concerns about your child, I, I don't think you've spoken to Mrs. <coughs> tell us about class size. I would encourage you to do so because she's on the front line every day and she can help to talk to you about the resources that we have. <laughs> but I, again, I would encourage you to go to her because she's there every day and have that conversation, okay? Right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Question for you, Mr. Naples. Does the board take minutes at your executive sessions? I believe you would have asked that question and you did not answer that. No. If you not. Are you required to? No. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Lake, last one question. Can, can I present you with your the school district's website paper that's sitting right there? Yes, sir. Can I approach you? I mean, I this, 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 be my, I'm sorry. This, this is, thank you, sir. This is the school district's website. And it says you have to take minutes and then release them when the need for an on and then, well, an on and then, the I can't, is no longer needed. That's your website. So we need to start taking minutes. Please don't change the website before I get home. Hey, That's the only coffee I have. Township. Um, I will tell you that I spent several days this week literally writing out a presentation for you because I don't know that there's been anything more important I've done recently. Unfortunately, after I got here tonight and I heard a few presentations, I no longer feel that what I wrote is applicable. And so, as I tend to do when I speak rather than write, I will ramble, so you have my apologies in advance. I also know Mr. Nagels well enough to know he'll set me off the podium, so I'll try to, I'll try to wrap it up. Um, I came here thinking I was going to defend the building of the new LES um, because I admit to being sucked into social media. I am a Facebook fan. I have a small number of very loyal friends who I check on every day. And around the neighborhood, I heard about a couple of social media sites um, that are spending a great deal of time uh, tearing up the good name of Greater Latrobe School District. Um, I came to Greater Latrobe in well, we did Latrobe area in 1984. Started educating kids here in 1989, and my baby just graduated in 2017. So you can imagine that I saw some changes in Greater Latrobe over those years. It's a significant number of years to have kids in the district. Um, I came through times when we had members of the board who felt their entire. Um, service to the community and service to the board was to do nothing other than to say we will not spend money, we will not raise taxes, period, I don't care what you need, end of discussion. And I'm here to represent what an unhealthy attitude that is for the life of a school district, for the life of a community, and for the homeowners who are invested in the community. Whether you have children in the schools or you don't. Uh, we had a time when our physical plants were barely functional whenever we were trying to take circles and turn them into classrooms, which meant we had pie-shaped wedges, which meant we had no air conditioning, no heat, and a lot of noise. It was not functional. And yet we had board members who refused to consider a spending plan that would raise taxes and die. We had members of the board who literally, I heard these words with my own ears and 20 plus years, maybe 30 years later, I cannot believe I heard these words from a school director who said, if we are not required to provide advanced science and math, why should we? Now imagine if we had listened to that plan back in, what would it have been, about 1990 something, and we had not pursued advanced 
sciences and math at Greater Lake Road, and we had provided only the basics required by the state where we would stand as a school district today. The education provided here is beyond reproach. I can't thank you enough for what you've done for my children. Um, and every taxpayer in the Greater Lake Church School District should be thanking you. The goulash and gibberish that is passed around saying that taxes are being raised without consideration, that money is being spent frivolously, is purely ridiculous. We all know it. You know it. Everyone here knows it. Every spending plan is discussed. Every dime is debated. They squeeze every nickel till there's nothing left. And you're wrong if you believe otherwise. Everything that's been presented here tonight has been hearsay. What I heard in the parking lot, what I heard at the bar, what I overheard someone saying. We need to deal in facts, not gossip. And the facts are, Greater Lake Trobe is not a high tax district. We are third from the bottom out of 17 districts in Westmoreland County. The board, the board knows. But you address people by name. And when you start addressing people by name, then you're going to get it right back from Mrs. Sreff. Good for you. Because you don't have the right to tear down the good name of a hardworking administrator. And I don't appreciate seeing on social media a school board member who chooses to support what you know is untrue. What you know is gossip. You know better than to make problems out of nothing. But you're choosing to do it for the sake of your own personal upset and your own personal vendettas. And I didn't intend to call you out tonight. But what I've seen here tonight leads me to believe that I must. So, the facts are we are not overtaxed. The facts are that this district is presenting an honorable education, a highly ranked education. The students leaving here are prepared <coughs> and being accepted to the best, to the, to the highest level districts, the highest level colleges that they are applying to. Mrs. Scott, I'm sorry, I'm done. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I thought I'd give that 30 second warning. I was trying to give it to you. <laughs> I thought I was a little upset as I was afraid I would. Sorry. Thank you for your service to the district, to our children, and to our community. And Mike, I'd love to meet you personally, because I've known you for a long time. I'm sorry.
They want to help our school district move forward and do the best for the children. That's why we're here. We have an administration that's doing the best we can. We have disagreements. I frankly disagree with class size, and I've let it not been there all the time. But you know, this is a democracy, and we have nine people on the board. So we vote on this. Everybody has input. Everybody knows exactly where every dime is spent. I'm telling you that right now. My driveway hasn't been fixed in 15 years. So you can look at anything you want to. I don't get money from the school board. Nobody does. <laughs> so this is ridiculous for me to sit and listen to this stuff. I resent it. I'm not going to be sitting here and be called a liar. I'm not going to be sitting here and be called unethical. I think that's bullshit and I'm not going to put up with it. If you think I'm a liar, you tell it to my face. I'm not going to listen to it. We do a service for this community. We work hard for this community. We put lots of hours into this school board to help this community. And that's what I'm going to continue to do because I believe that we owe our children the best that we can give them. And that's why I'm continuing to be on this board. I'd like to echo the, the words of Dr. Zorch. My, my concern is that in the article, it said several board members need to resign. And without knowing who that is, it puts a shadow of doubt on every one of us. So if there's something I have done, I'd like to know what it is I've done that warrants that I should resign, or anyone else for that matter. Because without any names being named, every one of us is under suspicion, even if we're innocent. And that makes the community think that every one of us who's sitting here has done something wrong. And so if we have, and, and Mike, if you, if you feel we have them, then let's, let's get it out tonight, let's do it. Well, you know what, there was a lack of transparency in an executive session meeting. You know, we, we got out of an executive session meeting, went back and we went into a public meeting, and we made everything look rosy with the new school. We had no right to do that. We know better, and we're better than that. And that's why I made the comments I did. So if you have problems with that, so be it. I'm not gonna change. I'm gonna be the same way I am, and that's the way that it is. But my Mrs. Surratt, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you. Believe me, I have known you a long time. You have known me a long time. We've been on the same side of a number of issues. But when I see what's going on, to, to tearing down the name of strong, hardworking individuals, I can't sit back and allow it. So you and I, I have all kind of time for you, Mike, and we'll talk it out. And you know what? I think that, that we should all be able to look in the mirror and be proud of what we said. And I'm not sure that you would be able to do that with some of the things that you've said publicly in recent in recent weeks. And I, I, I'm ready when you are. Tell me when you're free, and I'll be glad. To meet Absolutely. You. Thank you. But I, I still want to go back to the transparency. We're, we're, I, I keep hearing this. Let's be transparent. I'm sitting here. People are coming up to me and saying, "Hey, I, you know, I hear one of the board members thinks that uh, everybody should quit, should resign. Why?" I can't answer that question. I don't know if you're talking about me, and if so, what it is I did that warrants to be resigned, or anyone else sitting here. And so I just, we're here, it's a public meeting, let's be transparent. Is there something I have done as a member of this board that warrants that I should be resigned? Yeah. I'm not gonna say, Steve, at, at this point. Well, then you're not being transparent. Uh, I'll, I'll be transparent. You, you know what, you know who you are. I guess you never answered my question about transparency. After the executive session meeting, and we went into a public meeting, and we sat here like a bunch of mushrooms. And we, we let George Dickerson give a presentation, Judy asked, asked a question, and we just sat there, and when we should have probably said, hey, we have some problems. The school is not gonna open on time. But we didn't. So, you know what, you can think what you want of me, and as I said, I'm not going to change. Anyone else? Move for adoption of resolution number 50. Motion on the floor and second. All in 
favor. 